Hello, everybody. This is Jeremy McGovern. I'm with American Farriers Journal, and I want to thank you for joining us for our webinar tonight. We'll begin in just a moment, but let me get a few announcements out of the way. This presentation will run about 30 minutes or so, and after that, we'll have a Q&A session. If you look at the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a tab for questions. You can submit any question throughout the webinar, and I'll go through these and ask Dr. Zacharias as many as possible at the end of the webinar. If you experience any technological issues, such as the audio or with the display, and I don't interrupt the presenter with the problem, the issue is very likely on your end. And in case of any technical issues, it'll be best to call the GoToWebinar helpline. And so get a pen or pencil ready and I'll give that number. Uh, they'll be able to trouble troubleshoot your problem and they're very quick to respond. Uh, that number in the US is 800. 263-6317. Anywhere else in the world is 1-805-617-7000. Again, for the U.S., that's 800-263-6317. And anywhere else is 1-805-617-7000. If the webinar session crashes, re-enter through the same link that brought you here. And if it crashes for all of us, I'll relaunch the session and we'll wait a few minutes for everybody to rejoin us and we'll pick up right where Dr. Zacharias left off. Before we begin, I'd also like to thank DECRA for sponsoring tonight's webinar. This is a lot of great information. Uh, we went through it yesterday and uh, really looking forward to this. So with that, I'm going to unmute Dr. Zacharias and we'll turn it over to you, Josh. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Zacharias. I work in Greeley, Colorado, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about um, some strategies for navicular syndrome management. Um, the goal of this presentation tonight is just kind of give a, a more of a complete overview of some current practices and, and uh, theories on treatment and management of navicular syndrome, navicular disease, and, and so forth. I am a veterinarian, I'm a surgeon, and I'm also a farrier, um, about 17 years of experience with, with uh, with horseshoe, and as uh, I did that through through vet school, and so I've got some experience on on both sides of the of the coin, so to speak. So, with that, we'll go on. And the first thing we would need to kind of cover is uh, the navicular bone and and what the function of that is. And and um, you know the the main thing with the navicular bone is that it provides a constant angle of insertion of the deep flexor tendon. The deep flexor tendon is the is a tendon that runs down the back of the leg and, and across the back of the navicular bone, which is this structure here. I hope you guys can see my my pointer. Um, and then it attaches on the underneath side of that uh, coffin bone. And, and uh, for those of you that have been through shoeing school, it's one of the first things that that uh, in in anatomy that uh, you guys would cover. But um, you know, it, it is a fulcrum uh, to kind of provide that constant angle of insertion. So what exactly is navicular disease? And, and we're not going to get into the discussion of navicular disease to, versus navicular syndrome so much, um, but it's a chronic forelimb lameness uh, associated with pain arising from that distal sesamoid or navicular bone and its closely related structures, uh, and including some of the soft tissue around that, uh, but not necessarily the deep flexor tendonitis or an injury to that tendon, uh, the deep tendon uh, directly. So. It, it is not necessarily a single disease, um, and it is an, it has been recognized for quite a long time. It's been recognized as far back as 1752, and, and probably been recognized as some some form of of lameness back even before that. So it's common in mature riding horses, especially quarter horses, stock horse uh, type of breeds, um, warm bloods and thoroughbreds as well. Uh, the, the age of onset of clinical signs is quite variable, but um, seven to nine years is what a lot of the textbooks will say, but I, I've found that to be really unreliable as far as, you know, uh, an age of onset. Um, I do feel like that the one-third of all chronic forelimb lameness uh, as this disease is accounting for those, um, per, that percentage of horses with chronic forelimb lameness, I feel like that's fairly accurate, at least in our practice here. So. So some of the history that we hear uh, or that we hear from clients or farriers and, and one thing to, to note is that a lot of times the farriers are, are the first line of defense uh, or first line of, of recognition of a problem. Sometimes the owners don't really realize that and so, um, you know, I think that's 
one thing that we see here a lot as well is that uh, the farrier is going to be, you know, somebody that may pick up on this and say, hey, maybe this is something that that we need to have looked at. You know, maybe get some radiographs or something along those lines. And so, um, I would assume that that's that's common across the country as well. But one of the main things is that those horses will point a point a limb when they're resting. I think we've all probably seen these horses where they're just standing there you know, maybe not doing anything and they just got a leg out in front of them. And that's just kind of a sign of, of some discomfort. Um, but then the other, the main thing is some exhibition of lameness. And this is usually at a trot. Uh, oftentimes it's going to be worse on the inside of a circle at a trot and on hard ground. Uh, might be described as a short choppy stride, uh, maybe a shortened uh, caudal phase of the stride. So there's some various uh, ways to describe that lameness. But it is often bilateral. Uh, occasionally, the uh, one side is more predominant, but you know when we go to block and, and uh, block one side, sometimes the other, a lot of times the other side will will be similar. Uh, there is question on whether this is hereditary. Uh, I think a lot of it deals with conformation. Um, you know, if a horse has poor conformation uh, in the legs, the feet, uh, that is going to be passed on uh, genetically potentially, and that can lead to some you know, development of navicular disease or uh, or issues within that foot. Uh, so, you know, there is a hereditary component in that regard, but the, the disease itself uh, really hasn't been shown to, you know, be specifically hereditary. Poor foot conformation, you know, these horses that have these low heels, long toes, uh, the picture in the upper right-hand corner is kind of an ideal, uh, not an ideal, a, a typical, I should say, uh, foot conformation of, of a pretty severe uh, poor foot conformation of a horse that may have navicular issues or at least some issues in the back of the, the palmar aspect of the foot. Uh, the hoof pastern access is is very important in the, and we'll get to that here in a little bit, in the biomechanics of the navicular area. Uh, so sometimes the external uh, hoof pastern access does not always match what's what's inside as far as radiographically. A lot of times it is close, but sometimes that, that doesn't really portray uh, what's going on inside. Contracted heels, the small feet versus relative uh, to the body size uh, is is quite often seen as well in some in some uh, breed lines, and then occasionally you know we see the uh, horse that maybe hasn't been you know taken care of properly by the owner, getting the feet trimmed properly, or have had some you know some shoes left on too long for uh, for a significant period of time. That may play a role, mostly in the imbalance issue, and and we might see more of a soft tissue. Uh, condition uh, developing because of something like that. So how do we diagnose this? Uh, I'm not going to get too too much in depth of this. A lot of these are things that you guys would probably do out there as well. Uh, you know, the lameness evaluation, watching the horse go, physical exam of the lower extremities especially, palpation of tendons and, and joint. Uh, we'll palpate the joint fluid in the coffin joint and, and tendon sheath uh, fluid as well. Um, but the big thing is watching these horses go if they're lame or not. Um, you know, we will do flexion tests, of course, as well, and that's where we just hold the hold the uh, let's say the lower limb in in a flex state for a period of time, and then we'll watch the horse and see if the horse goes off more lame than than what uh, what the baseline was. Um, some a lot of times with navicular disease, however, these flexion tests are are uh, have a minimal response or a negative response. Um, unless there's some other concurrent disease going on. Um, a lot of times we'll do a toe elevation where we just set them, their toe on a block of, of wood or something, and, and a lot of the navicular horses will tend to respond to that, but not all of them. Uh, evaluate the hoof um, you know, for the confirmation, of course. You know, medial lateral imbalance uh, is important as well, but um, cranial caudal or, or anterior posterior uh, uh, in balance is, is important to look at and, and to note, of course, um, but hoof testing this horse or these horses, uh, a lot of times they'll be, some of them will be positive over the frogs, but not all of them. And we'll go on to do nerve blocks in, in most of them, at least on the initial visit. Most of them will, will block to that first block, essentially the heel block or the palmar digital nerve block, where they um, it numbs the back, the caudal third of the foot and all of the soul, and, and most of these horses are going to respond, usually 50, 60 percent at least, um, but uh, most of them are going to respond in that 70 to 80 percent to those. So the other thing is response to treatment. These horses typically are going to, um, you know, we'll try some, some form of treatment and go on and, 
and if they respond, um, sometimes that's uh, suggestive of, of what's going on as well. We do like to watch, um, you know, gait evaluation as well. Um, you know, the big thing with with some of these more mild cases is they are going to be lame on the inside foot. So this horse is uh, trotting to the right and is showing a, a downward uh, carriage of the head. Uh, on that outside leg, and sh and so both of these are indicating a, an inside leg lameness, and this is just the same day, just in different directions, and that's something that we'll often see, and uh, when we go on and do a nerve block, that's going to be pretty common. So, uh, this these are just some photographs of some of those diagnostic tests. The nerve block on the left, that's the location we do that nerve block. Hoof testers and and the wedge test, again, um, you know the hoof testers. I'm uh, I assume a lot of you guys are are doing that as well, and so that's something that you might, as might pick up on uh, to to indicate to the owner that maybe we ought to look a little deeper. Um, the wedge test is something that you guys could do as well. Watch a horse go, and and then see if uh, you know if that's something that that horse responds negatively to. Uh, we go on and do imaging, and I'm not going to get a whole lot into this other than the fact that you guys probably see a lot of a lot of radiographs that are are taken. Um, you know, radiographs are the number one imaging modality that we use, but we also use ultrasound and MRI, and, and some of these other uh, modalities are going to be used or might pick up some navicular disease. The, the bone scan or nuclear scintigraphy in this lower left-hand corner is uh, is something that has, you know, this, this image has a hot navicular bone. MRI is, is probably the main thing that uh, is probably the newest imaging modality that uh, it's really helpful with soft tissue or, or horses that don't just have navicular bone disease but has some of the soft tissue to go with it as well. So the pathology of navicular disease, uh, there's some different theories on, on how or why this develops. Um, and, you know, the, the main three are a vascular ischemic loss of blood supply to that bone. Uh, maybe is is isn't as supported as as we'd like to like it to be with uh you know with some research and pathology um in in some horses that have had navicular disease there's really not not been any ischemic bone identified, but we still feel like there's a blood flow issue in some of these horses when they get a, a more of a dense navicular bone um probably the big thing that has the most support is biomechanical forces on that navicular bone and the caudal aspect of that foot. We get some compressive forces, the stress on the navicular bone, and then increased stresses and forces on the deep flexor tendon. And on some of the cartilage aspects or cartilage surfaces of the navicular bone, we will see some degeneration of that cartilage, similar to some arthritic uh, changes in joints as well. And so uh, there's probably a combination of all of these, but that chronic inflammation can play a role as well. So on the biomechanical aspect, you know, if we look at the forces acting on this region, we have the weight of the horse coming down and the pressure from the ground coming back up, but we also have tension on the, all of the ligamentous and, and tendon uh, structures, the deep flexor tendon and, and the uh, collateral ligament of the navicular bone and part ligament is all going to be putting tension on that. And this translates usually to mostly to a compressive force on that navicular bone and, and that uh, can become a major issue uh, on how that bone reacts to those stresses. So just a little bit on pathology of these uh, of the navicular bone in this disease. I'm just going to scroll through a few of these things that we see on radiographs, and I'm sure some of you have seen uh, these as well on some films that have been sent to you. Um, but we'll see these enlarged synovial invaginations, and these are just lytic lesions where the mineral is, has been uh, taken out of the, of the areas of the bone. Some of them can become cystic or quite large, and that uh, and that can be can can actually weaken the bone uh, when that happens, but that's usually a very fairly painful process. Um, sometimes we'll get these really severe changes on these distal borders where we get some you know looks like some mice have been chewing on the distal aspect of that bone. That's going to be more of a severe case, of course. Um, we'll also see some medullary sclerosis, uh, which is just sclerosis is just the the increase in mineral content of that bone, and so that's one of the ways the body reacts to those compressive forces is it puts down more more mineral in that in that bone to kind of withstand those forces. Uh, we'll see edema or swelling of the of that bone tissue or fibrosis and scarring. And occasionally we'll see some osteonecrosis or just some death of some areas of the bone. Um, we like we often will see this fading 
this lower right hand corner here of this uh, cortical medullary junction which is just the outer shell of the navicular bone and the uh, intermedullary cavity that should be a fairly distinct area or distinct line and a lot of times we'll see that become more of a gradient. Uh, occasionally we'll see cough and joint issues as well and so that's uh, one of the concurrent uh, one of the more common things that we see concurrently with navicular diseases, the development of cough and joint arthritis. So if the flexor surface cartilage and the cortical bone degeneration is something that we often uh, see as well with navicular disease and, and these are severe cases over here where we see this flexor surface or this cortex uh, of the navicular bone has some, some loss of mineral content and, and those horses usually have a pretty poor prognosis when they have that just because that erodes on that deep flexor tendon as it rides over the, that aspect of the bone. Uh, and then some soft tissue stuff, bursitis and collateral ligament and thesiophytes. Uh, those are these, these bat wing appearances on the navicular bone that we see. Um, but that all of these soft tissue issues still relate back to uh, potentially some imbalance or some, some abnormal stresses on that caudal aspect of the foot. So where the pain comes from with navicular disease, uh, there's there's quite a few different um, areas where the pain can come from. But the number one thing I think is bone, at least in navicular disease, and and that's probably due to a couple of things. Number one is increased intraosseous pressure. The blood pressure within that bone, or the hydrostatic pressure within that bone, is is usually increased, and that can be very painful. And the other thing is osteoclastic bone resorption. So there tends to be um, with with osteoclast or, or loss of removal of mineral out of bone, that process is very painful, and we'll get to, the, to that in just a second, but that's a, a source of pain. We can also get these adhesions between the navicular bone and the deep flexor tendon and other soft tissue injuries as well. So what do we do to treat these horses? Um, the first thing to do is control controlled exercise. So we don't like to just throw them in a stall. Um, you know, that was some some people have that opinion to just stall rest these horses and I think rest for for most you know average navicular horses is to actually exercise them lightly or at least turn them out um, and, and maybe take them out of forced work depending on the level of level of lameness and the, the severity of the disease and, and that's one thing that we have to take into account not one and not every horse is going to be the same there's there's a wide range of severity of of the of the disease as well as the um, you know, the, what the horse does for a living makes a, uh, plays a big role in, in what we're going to do with these guys. Um, as far as, tr you know, true treatment or therapy, the, I always tell clients that this is the therapeutic shoeing, corrective shoeing, you know, uh, proper balance shoeing may not even be considered corrective or therapeutic. I like the term therapeutic better, but um, is that is going to be the, the number one thing. It, you know, it may take the it may take take the longest to see any results from shoeing, but it's going to be the most important and get us the get us the um, the results we want typically in the in the long run. So that's where I almost always start is is if there's issues with the foot, we start with with shoeing, get them set up, and then we might come back and do some of these other other things as far as injections. Um, but that's the first discussion, at least that I'll have uh, is is make sure that our shoeing's good. And so the reason that is is because we can change the biomechanics of the foot. If we don't really change the biomechanics of a foot that's that's you know maybe out of balance or has you know too long of a toe, no matter what we do, we're going to just be fighting a fight fighting an uphill battle. So um, by you know changing these uh, shoeing techniques or or uh, how a certain horse is set up, we can reduce that stress, reduce a concussion potentially. Um, but there is is no right way to shoe a horse with navicular disease. Uh, a lot of it is trial and error. The principles uh, are going to be similar along the way, but what works for one horse may not work for the next three or four. So that's one thing I, I advise clients as well is that, that we need to kind of take that into account that we're not going to necessarily expect this horse to, with, with shoeing alone, to, to change uh, overnight or we not necessarily uh, we might have to go ahead and change, you know, what we've what we've put on the horse for shoes. So, the uh, the principles of what we like to do for therapeutic shoeing, you know, in a generality, is breakover or leverage reduction to reduce a compressive force on the, on the navicular bone from the deep uh, flexor tendon, putting tension 
on uh, on that ten from tension on the deep flexor tendon and compression of the bone, uh, reduce strain on the other soft tissue structures as well. If there are any medial lateral uh, imbalances, we need to address those uh, also. So not every horse is going to have those, but occasionally we'll see that uh, that we need to address those. Uh, wedge heel. Sometimes we'll we'll uh, wedge them, and sometimes we won't, and that kind of depends a lot on the radiographs and the and the foot balance, especially the craniocaudal foot balance of that horse, where the breakover is, and and then that's if there's any compromise to the to the heel structure of that foot. But not every horse that has navicular disease needs needs its heels wedged. Sometimes we'll start with them wedged till they kind of improve them, and then we like to get them out of them if we can. So. Um, it may reduce the compressive force on the navicular bone from the deep flexor tendon. Um, it does reduce the tension on that flexor tendon, we know that, but the one thing that uh, I have seen is that it may increase that concussive force from the ground in the heel region and uh, over time can have some potential to crush those heels. So um, caudal support, and that's, uh, that's where we just essentially give us a little bit more he uh, heel support behind, um, kind of align some uh, that that shoe to where we're getting some support under those, uh, maybe a little bit more under those heel bulbs, um, and basically increase the effective weight bearing uh, surface of that foot. And then pads, um, if they're if they're really sore to hook testers, sometimes we'll just put some pads on with with no impression material. Uh, and a lot of horses, uh, if they've got some soft tissue damage or some injuries to the soft tissue, they will like some some form of of support, you know, so some form of impression material type of support. So the breakover reduction, there's no right way to, or right shoe. There's a lot of shoes on the market. There's a lot of handmade techniques to, to reduce a breakover. Uh, you can take the same shoe that was on the horse and set the shoe uh, beyond, behind the toe and do uh, a, a lot of good actually by uh, reducing that breakover. And so uh, usually it's a combination of techniques. Um, these shoes with these rolled toes uh, and, and rolled branches uh, are quite effective, easy to put on for, for most guys. There's, there's some newer shoes on the market that kind of take those into a, a steel shoe type of, of issue. But there's, uh, if you follow that line, I hope that shows up, if you follow that line down to the level of that foot, you know, we essentially uh, effectively reduce that breakover point by moving that um, you know, last point caudally on that foot. Uh, here's some of the more of the, the traditional AFA type of uh, techniques, you know, the rolled toe, rocker toe, squared toe, and those are all good techniques that I, I still use to this day. Um, you know, if I've got the time to hand make one, I, I, I do like to do that, but um, sometimes my, my day doesn't account for that, so I'll, I'll kind of fall back on some of these other techniques. So again, you know, Find what works for for you, but these are the the principles are to um, you know basically pull that breakover back uh, caudally in that foot. Uh, as far as wedge heel uh, goes, the wedge heel effect of the effect of the deep flexor tendon uh, essentially straightens that angle as it comes across the back of that navicular bone, and, and so that takes tension off of that flexor tendon as well as uh, reduces the friction and the and the uh, compressive forces on that navicular bone just by wedging that heel up. Caudal support, uh, I'm curious to see how many people are still using egg bars. Um, you know, I, I don't, but I know there are some people that still do, and, and uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, um, but the idea behind caudal support is that we take the center of, uh, of gr the ground reaction force or the center of the weight-bearing surface of that shoe uh, and move it back by re by uh, extending that weight bearing surface to the caudally there, and so that can do uh, number one, it reduces the essentially the force per square inch uh, on the bottom of that foot, but it also kind of helps align or support the the caudal structures of that foot. So these are some shoes that you know have been been used uh, variously uh, in my career, uh, from the handmade straight bars to these to the navicular shoe. Um, and, and various pads to just an extended heel type of shoe. And so, again, it's it's more the application. In, in my world, it's more the application and not necessarily any one specific shoe. Pads, uh, hard pads with impression material to, to the more of the um, Equipack type of products. I, I feel like I've had good success with both types. 
um, you know, if they can handle that impressed material, and I feel like that supports the soft tissue. I have gone to uh, and used some of the the what I call rigid sole pack, or the, the kind of where people are uh, gluing uh, the bottom of the foot and some of the more severe soft tissue injuries, not so much just the navicular disease. So. Um, I won't get into that a whole lot, but other things are the anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, which would be your but and banamine, um, your uh, Equiox, those types of products. Uh, the the vascular or the the uh, circulation drugs, the pentoxypilin and nisoxaprine, um, with various effects. Or they're older drugs that that haven't really been been greatly. Um, effective but in some cases they can can be helpful of course local medication intracenovial so bursa injections tendon sheath injections and coffin joint injections with typically steroids or irap or prp those are going to be some of the of the things that we'll do concurrently depending on what we're finding on the clinical exam and can be quite effective uh, in in many cases the disease modifying osteoarthritic drugs those are going to be drugs like the adequan the legend um, and some of the oral supplements uh, can be classified in that, but essentially your joint supplement drugs, uh, especially the injectable ones, um, and those can have an effect on the navicular bone, the soft tissue around it, the cartilage that's, that's on the flexor surface and articular surfaces uh, can be can be quite beneficial, at least in helping manage um, some of these uh, some of these disease or this disease. Uh, shockwave. I've had some had some various uh, results with shockwave, and and I'm sure there's still uh, quite a few vets that are shockwaving navicular horses. But I, I feel like that's probably on the on kind of the downhill slide. I think there's a lot less of that going on, but but at times it may be effective. And then the the newer drugs, uh, the bisphosphonates, um, is the the kind of the the exciting uh, part in our world as far as veterinarians go, and I'm, I'm sure all of you as farriers have have uh, come across this too, um, you know, as far as clients asking about it with the navicular horses, and, and we're going to go into that here in just a second. Pre, uh, before bisphosphonate drugs, just to give you an overview of what the prognosis was before, clinical resolution was up to about 50 percent uh, with with depending on the uh, severity of the disease, um, depending on tr treatments employed. If there's soft tissue, it gets worse, and then if there's severe radiographic abnormalities, it's pretty poor. So so what do bis what does bisphosphonate drugs do? The clodronate or osphos is the uh, name of the, the one that's being used um, commonly, and um, you know it's the one we use here in our practice. And and so to, to describe what the drug does, we have to talk a little bit about physiology and in bone metabolism and so when bone is made up of of mineral and and other matrix but the mineral part of, of bone is always under um, remodeling uh, remodeling and, and basically a homeostatic event uh, and so there's osteoclasts which are the cells that remove the mineral out of the bone so that the osteoblasts are the cells that actually put mineral back in the bisphosphonates block these osteoclasts uh, to slow down that re removal of bone, and that's how that works, or how those drugs work. Um, so in bone remodeling, uh, bone resorption is complete within about three weeks. Uh, again, it is an ongoing process, but in general it is a, a, a fairly quick event, and then the bone formation or the mineralization of that bone is longer, it takes about three months. So during times of chronic bone disease, such as navicular syndrome, that bone remodeling is accelerated and usually um, unbalanced or imbalanced. And so the increased bone resorption is quite often, uh, compared to the bone formation, is quite often the case. And so bisphosphonates, again, regulate that metabolism or that um, homeostasis by inhibiting the bone resorption via uh, decreasing the activity of those osteoclasts, the cells that remove that mineral. And so that's, that's how, in a nutshell, how those, how uh, bisphosphonates work on bone metabolism. So some of the effect of bisphosphonates, um, you know, again, there's, it's been studied widely in the human, human world for various diseases, um, but they have an, an typically have, will have some level of anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Um, and again, they've been shown for decreased inflammatory mediators or chemicals that are involved in inflammation. And uh, they've, some of them have been shown to be cartilage protective 
Uh, it's been used in, for cancer in people uh, to try to reduce uh, bone metastasis. Um, and the number one thing that why we're using it in horses is the anti-resorptive effect, which does uh, play a role in analgesia, of course, by reducing the, the resor resorption of minerals. So uh, it's been shown by decreasing biomarkers of the resorption and increased bone mineral density. Um, and this is all related to, uh, directly to the inhibition of those osteoclasts. There is an analgesic effect that is in, independent of the anti-resorptive effect. It's not very widely known, um, but I just will mention it to be on the complete side is that there there is kind of a, a, a side uh, analgesic effect too, so a little bit more pain relief besides what's going on with the, the decrease in resorption. So OSFOS has uh, been labeled for the uh, indication of clinical signs associated with navicular disease. It is an easy to give uh, drug. It's given in the muscle. Um, the dose is on, on the box, but it's 1.8 megs per keg. So up to essentially a 15 mil dose is the max dose. And, and then we divide it in three spots, so three separate uh, intramuscular injections. So it was recently approved. Um, I've pretty much been on board since since we've had access to it, and, and I've not, not really turned back. So um, the clinical study, the FDA clinical study, effectiveness study, the, the most impressive result here, uh, and this is really the only slide I'm going to show on that just because it's so impressive, is the, the horses that were treated out of those horses, almost 75% of them had a successful uh, a, a success rate uh, or a success and uh, where the controls were only about 3%. So that's a, that's a huge difference, a very significant difference. And, and this was a, it was a well-designed study. Uh, if you go and, and actually read that paper, it was a well-designed study and, and actually has some merit behind it. And so that was uh, quite a selling point to me. Uh, one, the, the, as far as the drug goes, I'm just going to, uh, you'll hear uh, some potential side effects. This is really the, the main side effect uh, is the post-injection discomfort or agitation. And so, um, you know, some of this probably comes from the, the drug kind of burning, uh, you know, at the injection site potentially, but I've not had any, I, I myself have not had any issues with the uh, injection site reactions post, uh, you know, post-treatment. But this is typically what we'll see, a horse that just gets a little agitated, they might yawn a little bit, uh, maybe see one paw, um, it is possible for them to colic or to get a little more uncomfortable, but most of the time that is very short-lived and, and easily treatable. Um, but I do advise clients to, you know, uh, watch these horses for signs of colics for the next two to three hours. It is excreted in the kidneys, and so uh, we want to make sure that their kidneys are functioning, that they're drinking well, and they're urinating well. So my expectations for horses that I treat uh, is that I do expect the horses to improve on lameness scores, um, but I may not see any changes on the radiographs, um, you know, or any of the imaging necessarily, but especially the radiographs. Uh, having said that, I have seen some significant changes, uh, a little bit surprising in, in cases that we've seen some changes on, on radiographs, but typically I don't expect those channels to fill in or the cystic lesion is to fill in, but I do expect the pain to improve. So just a couple cases here and then we'll finish up. Uh, you know, it, it, this is just a couple examples of some horses that I've used it in um, fairly early on, actually. Uh, this is a 12-year-old barrel, barrel horse mare uh, with bilateral forelimb lameness. It was about a 2 out of 5 and blocked about 80% to that heel block, the palmar digital nerve block, uh, treated with wedged heel, PLRs initially and the rigid sole pack and that's the that's the the glue uh where we put we're putting that in and then osphos and that horse came back at 30 days and was 70 percent improved and and that's kind of a common thing you know one thing to note is that how this horse came in to us was with a quite a severe I don't have any measurements on here, but a, a definitely a negative palmar angle here, and so definitely corrected that, and that's why that horse went into the wedges, is to uh, help us get that corrected. We had some of those enthesiophytes where the collateral ligament or the navicular suspensory ligament attaches, um, and so you know that just tells you there's some soft tissue stuff going on as well. And then we get some of these these channel changes in the navicular in the medullary cavity of the navicular bone, as well as some uh, lysis in that flexor cortex 
Um, and so those, that's that's a pretty typical case. This next case is a 14-year-old uh, pleasure mare. It was about a two out of five bilateral and blocked to the heel block. Uh, was severely broken back at one time. Uh, did have some tendon sheath effusion and, and potentially um, possible thick and medial aspect of the suspensory ligament, that navicular bone. But we treated this horse with a wedge heel uh, and coffin joint, as well as bursa injections um, and osphos. And, and one thing to note is that we did notice a release during that bursa injection, which um, when that happens, usually we suspect a, some scar tissue or an adhesion in there that we're breaking down. Um, but that horse went on to show well, and, and that is, was the first horse that I actually repeated osphos on, and that was at seven months. And so I find that um, uh, quite, quite a small percentage of the horses that I treat that I've had to go back and, and uh, retreat, but you can retreat these horses. Um, three to six months, depending on what's going on. Um, but the, the handful that I have had to retreat have been, you know, in that seven, eight month, uh, a few of them been out to a year, actually. Another mare, barrel horse mare. And I put this one in here because some of these changes can actually be on this uh, the corner, so to speak, of that, the, that distal border. Uh, this horse actually... Um, I think on another view shows a distal border fragment, and so sometimes those horses don't do as well not to treatment in general. Um, but this horse we put in a rocker toe shoe with a three degree wedge pad, and uh, Osfos at three months later was a two out of five with a one plus hoof test over the frog, and and the horse didn't really have a structurally sound heel. So this is an example of one that we had to change up. Uh, we went to a steel shoe with impression material and floated the heels, uh, continuing to keep the horse in the in the wedge pad. And then within a couple of weeks, that horse went to one out of five. So that's a good example of if, if something, it doesn't seem to be working as well as we'd like it to be, uh, let's let's change it or try something else. And, and having said that, um, I, I do try to give, uh, you know, the horse some time to, you know, soak into what we've done. But if, if it's not working, then then don't don't necessarily want to keep doing that specific thing. We might change it or tweak it a little bit. Uh, just uh, another, this horse is a reining horse uh, that we did with uh, pads and, and reduced breakover, osphos. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these, but these are just showing some of those bone changes that we'll see, just more of a moderate or mild uh, changes on the navicular bone, except for on this lateral view, we're seeing that impar ligament area uh, have some some remodeling and reaction around that, uh, and then we get into more severe ones. And, and this horse is one that has some very large channels uh, in the in the uh, medullary cavity, and these horse this horse responded quite well, uh, fairly quickly. And so that just goes you to in, in my mind shows you that the horse had quite a bit of bone pain uh, in that navicular bone, and and when we treat that horse with, with osphos and just a little shoeing, we've got a significant improvement. Another severe one, this is more of a palliative uh, aspect and these this is one that you know you don't give a very good prognosis because of that flexor lesion and the severity of these lesions in that flexor surface. Don't expect that horse to do well, kind of 